And um, what chapter? Six. Chapter six. Look over here. We started it last week. Right? Yes. We were talking about the milk of the word and the meat of the word. And then we got into that paragraph that uh, talks about. About the impossibility of being restored if it is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they fall away to be brought back to repentance because in their loss, they are crucifying the son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. A long sentence, again, uh, Paul writes long sentences, but I suppose other people may have too. And the question we left was, how does this relate to what has gone before? Those thoughts about moving on from the basic principles to other things, to more, uh, in other places, the meat of the word um, talks about the elementary teachings, the foundation, and uh, moving on from those to solid food, he says. And did Paul just start writing about that, the milk and the solid food, and then think, well, I'll insert a paragraph on the possibility of apostasy, which means can people fall away? And there are many in the, the uh, so-called Christian world who feel that that's impossible that once you've been saved, you can't lose your salvation, that apostasy or falling back into sin to the extent that you might be lost is impossible. And uh, that goes back a long, long way. Um, even St. Francis or uh, Francis of Assisi believed that, uh, although the Catholic Church doesn't emphasize that. No, I, I think the Catholic Church believes in what? free will. I believe yeah, the Catholic yeah. Church believes in free will. They don't believe in the, the doctrine of, you know, once saved, always saved. Yes. A soft, soft Calvinism. I think the, the argument would be is that if you're going to say, like last week I said that it was a gift, you know, it, you know, it, it's a gift, faith is a gift, you know, God does not revoke his gifts, therefore, you know, you can't, God, you know, you can't lose your gift of eternal life. I, and I think that they would argue furthermore by saying that if you can reject God, you're more powerful than God. You are saying that you are more powerful than God. If you can turn away from God, so therefore you're more powerful than God. Okay, and I think that would be their argument by saying that. Well, if you're saying these things, then you know you're more powerful than God. And well, that's not know. true. <laughs> if the writer of this book would agree with that view of it, I think he's. It seems to me like he's saying, you know, if if you're just drinking the milk, you're, you're not building up your, uh, uh, your, your body. Yeah. So to speak, you know, like you spiritual need, health, really. children need yeah, you are no um, more that they need solid food to grow yeah. and to mature. And so if you can just continue drinking milk all the time, your, your faith, I think is weak. Yeah. And it's it's not growing, and maybe it's easier easier for you. It's like you become complacent, and then um, you're leaving an opening for the devil to yeah. come in yeah. and uh, kind of draw you further away. It's it's easier if your faith is deep. 
it's easier, yeah. easier to yeah. be drawn away when temptations come. I think that's what he's getting at here is that if you don't move beyond the basic principles or the milk of the word, there's that risk that, yes, you've tasted the heavenly gift. And, you know, why does he go on with all of those uh, metaphors, if you will, uh, if not to make it clear that some people say, well, these are people that they weren't really saved. If they fell away, they weren't really saved. And a lot of uh, people believe that in the world, that anybody who falls away, well, they never did come to Christ. I think these phrases are employed to make it clear that these are people that were saved. They've come to Christ and then fall away. And uh, I think that's, that's the point he's trying to make. Unless you grow and advance in your Christian faith from the milk, to the solid food, uh, there's a danger that you could fall away. Yeah, verse four is very clear. You know, train to serve good and evil. If you're not going to, if you're not going to train yourself to serve good and evil, then okay, you know, you're just yeah, going to slide into, you know, you're never going to, you know, slide into the trap of uh, of sin and yeah. the wickedness. To be, you're not going to be brought back to repentance. And again, what is, the, he lists the, the basic principles or some of the basic principles. And uh, we talked about some of those seem pretty, uh, you know, meaty because there's been a lot of debate and a lot of discussion on those topics, laying on of hands, what happens at the resurrection, what happens at the judgment. Are there, is there more than one judgment and all of that? But uh, those are the basic principles, but the solid food is what? <clears throat> well, we looked at the previous chapter, teaching about righteousness. What does it mean to live righteously? What does it mean to be more like Jesus. That's what the, the church, we said sometimes, uh, focuses on converting people. And it's easy to say we baptize a certain number of people in uh, the last year. Oh, you get a report from a missionary. Yeah, we baptized so many people here over the last year. But it's harder to measure how many people became more like Jesus? How do you measure that? How many people in the congregation made real strides in becoming more like Jesus? Or did we just kind of drift along during the year? It's hard to come up with a statistic on that. And we all are at different points along the Continuum, if we will, you know, for uh, some people to add one thing that other people have had, you know, how do you measure that? Uh, some people, you know, maybe become more giving. Other people uh, control their temper. Other people uh, come out of themselves and start talking to others more and showing concern for others instead of self. That's a big part of it, isn't it? Uh, the, that's how we advance, become less and less self-centered and more and more Christ-centered. So uh, anyway, I would just, sometimes when I think of that, I think of, uh, the life of a man who just died, Landon Saunders. They had his obituary in the Christian Chronicle. Maybe some of you have heard of him. He uh, talk, I gave a talk here one time uh, in this area about the Herald of Truth and some other works. <coughs> but he's a man, I've always kind of kept an eye on him because he's a eunuch for the kingdom of heaven's sake. And he said, I'm, I'm going to dedicate myself fully to the service of the church. 
and not get involved with a spouse and a family. And uh, he finally passed, he was 85 or something. And I've always, you know, you know he, he, Jesus talks about that, but uh, most of us uh, don't do that, if you will. But I, he's one who did. And uh, <clears throat> others are doing it, they probably don't get any notoriety, but anyway. That, that's kind of an advantage. He dedicated his life to the service of Christ and preaching. He had a radio program and did various things with media. Anyway, <laughs> that's I, I don't know. Other than doing what the Lord tells you to do, I mean, not everybody can step up to teaching, and not every man can step up to leadership. Right. But you know, doing what the Lord tells you to do, take care of you know, honoring your marriage and your family. Um, That's you know, I, I, I even had to speak out at a couple of churches and say, you don't honor these type of people, okay? You know, I mean, they, because the culture is honoring these people, you don't honor these people, okay? Uh, in the church, I don't, you know, personally, you know, like some of our politicians or something like that, I'm like, personally, uh, with your friends, your peers, that's one thing, but I mean, corporately, you know, as the church honoring people who are not appropriate, you know, you know, models for the church yeah. okay, corporately, oh, not yeah. individually. We tend to go on uh, with the world standards, if you will. And uh, who's the one that's deserving of honor, according to Jesus? It's the one who's the servant of all. The one who perhaps uh, we look down upon, uh, you know, the weak person, but maybe doing a lot uh, that we don't know about calling people, encouraging people. Uh, those are the ones that Jesus would say is deserving of honor. I like that word a lot. The one you just brought. Sometimes it regards some people thinking that. They are no way doing. But before God, they are the presence of God. Yeah, yeah. I was asking a question last week concerning the widow who gave the last coin. Yeah, and they almost said, two mites. And, we pulled the, and Jesus said, I praise this one more than That's everyone That's a good else. point. That's good. I praise this one more than everyone else. Yeah. But if it's a humanity, when people dress with a distance and giving this thing, I just say, oh, this one, wow, this is wow. But the one who know destiny says that this woman is wedding than all these people. Keep going. Yeah. So as for we, you see, no one can be like Jesus. He said it. Yeah. yeah but no one, no one. Right now. I was asking another question. Can anybody in a church say that remaining my last dollar, my last dollar in my pocket, and that dollar I'm giving it to church and go home? I don't know if somebody has done that before. I'm sure they have. Hmm? I'm sure people have done that. You sure? Have you done that? They have an example in the Bible of what exactly in the Bible. Jesus taught about it. Yeah. He wanted to follow some example. You see, some of the words of Jesus Christ is a figurative to bring us out, to make us wise. But he is directing us that eh, the world, the way it is, is not that sometimes we chase some sins, that this thing is a sin, this thing is a sin, yeah. this is a sin. But the real thing that is there for us to follow then we are doing away with them. We are dodging it. We are dodging. Like the way that said right now, he says somebody has done it before. That is why it's written in the Bible, right? Coming to you yourself and ask yourself, can I do it? Hopefully, we never have to get to that point. But I think we're willing. Yeah. We're all be willing. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, you want to give your last dollar. If you got special. You got family to take care of, right? <laughs> and feed every day. They eat a lot of food. <laughs> you see? So you don't want to do that. But it, 
Maybe you have to. <clears throat> and Jesus said, I, I, at the same time, I asked, I, mean, I can look 13. He said, if somebody slapped you, your left ear, turn the right to him. Can you do that? Hopefully, yes. I do. <laughs> <you. laughs> <laughs> you see, they went both ways. <laughs> Slap you. None of us know for sure. You never know for sure. You get that situation. What solution are you talking about here? No, to me, to me, I'm thinking Jesus is raising us up. That we should be wise. He said things in figurative, but we should be what? Wise. Not to reiterate, but that doesn't mean turn the right for the fellow to do what? To slap you again and say that that's what Jesus said. You are putting blame on Jesus. You are putting blame on Jesus. Yeah. Now, let us continue. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the other question that we kind of left ourselves with last time, we talked about that paragraph, uh, impossible to bring them to repentance. And we left with the question, does God ever give up on someone? And maybe that's not the best way to put it, but is there a point where God kind of, you know, he's working things in our lives to help us to be stronger Christians, to grow in Christ. He's trying to help us. But if we reject, is there a point at which God kind of gives up? I don't think he gives up. We give up. If, if our conscience is so seared, you know, another, another writer talks about that, probably wrong. We get to a point of no return. And that's what he's talking about here. I think. Yeah. Yeah. We get to a point where we just don't care. And we, we cast off the Holy Spirit and we say, well, I don't need you. And that's it. And we don't, and your heart gets so hardened, you don't come back. I kind of like the Pharaoh, you know, who hardened his heart, you know. Okay. I mean, even a, Reality, a, a level that is we can observe with like certain criminals and the, and the police and the authorities. You know, you're saying, you know, obviously these criminals think that they're more powerful than the authorities. I mean, you, 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 I mean we, 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 we watch the movies and the bad guy is shooting it out with the cop. Well, that happens in reality. I mean, you know. The, the, you know, the Boston bombers where the guy thinks that he's John Wayne and pulls like a bomb bounce off his chest and you know, they, you know, they, they want, you know, the authorities eventually get him and shoot him. I mean, because he's so wild and un uncontrolled and not, doesn't listen. I mean, there are people, not even Christians, you know, they don't listen. They don't listen to the laws. They don't listen to anything else. They just you know, they're wild, they're on the rampage, do whatever they want to do. Second, Second Peter. Okay. Uh, 3 9 says, The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. Okay. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, he yeah. wants everyone yeah. to repent. Well, I think we know all relationships are two uh, two way street, right? You gotta, you, there's got to be give and take on both sides, you know. And I think that's the way it is with God. He does a lot of. He plays a certain role. He, he gives us certain benefits, and, then, and it's up to us to respond. You know, we're going to either accept His love and you know, His <coughs> salvation, you know, His way of doing things, or we're not. And, and that's the way it is in any, any kind of friendship relationship. Even you've got to have it, you know, give and take on both sides. And uh, some people, they, they're not going to do their part. They're, they're not going to go their, their side of the street. You know? Like I say, it's a two-way street. In Romans, Paul says on a couple of occasions, therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts. God gave them over to shameful lusts. I think, I think they gave up first. And then maybe he just said, well, there's, there's no way they're ever going to change. So he kind of... That's the, well, that's that's yeah. the point that God has looked and seen. They're never going to change. 
Yeah, he knows. I'd he knows. hate to be in that situation. Wouldn't you? That's what I, I pray to God. If I make a mistake, don't give up on me <laughs> because I want to do better next time. That means you have a heart of change. Well, that's what we immediately you say that don't give up of me. That means you are remorse. Yeah. You have a remorse. We have people who, who don't have remorse. <clears throat> you see, First Corinthians chapter five, verse I mean thirteen. Yes. He even order us not to down with some people. Yeah. Why? Because you see that the go extent, not that God is giving up. Even the most rebellious person on this earth. God will never give up on you if only you change. If we fact, the guy was praying, you know, we pray that prayer, that shows there's still a connection there. Mm -hmm. There's still hope for us, you know. We're yeah. asking God to, to not give up on us. So, so if you are not changing and you are still pushing yourself, pushing yourself, you yourself give yourself up and God will leave you to go on. If you crash, maybe you come back. Love it, That's right. Yeah. God does. God, God wants everyone to repent, as you say. Uh, anyway, those were the questions which we were thinking about, and uh, it, then, so there's another paragraph now. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it. And it produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed, receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. So he, he's talking about the milk and the solid food. Then he's talking about you know, apostasy. Now he's talking about farming. Again, is there any connection there? <clears throat> we'll be known by our fruits. That's kind of the idea, okay. here, right? Like, okay. Produce bitter fruit, or are you going to produce good, healthy fruit? You know, in or your what you risk burning. That's not good. That kind of saying, unless we're producing good fruit as Christians, we're in danger of this. Uh, it says a lot about us, you know, about yeah. our hearts. Jesus looked at the fig tree. It wasn't producing fruit. And he spoke against it and it withered and died. Boy, I, again, hate to be in that situation where the Lord says, he's not bringing forth any good fruit. You know, he's out of it. Uh, he's worthless in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. So those are some pretty strong warnings. We need to look at our lives. Are we bringing forth any fruit for Jesus? Are we, you know, I think that's one of the, the basic principles is we take in, we take in teachings that we haven't heard before, but then there comes a time as we mature in Christ, where we need to be giving some back, not just constantly learning, as he says in another place, always learning, always learning, but never really getting to the point where we do any teaching or we do any work for Jesus. <clears throat> you know, we're, we would come like perpetual students. <laughs> so, uh, not a sponge. A sponge, so you yeah. Soak up everything, but you don't put anything out. Yeah. yeah. It's always taking in. Faithfully, maybe coming to classes, but what are we doing with the stuff that we talk about in class? So, anyway, that's what came to my mind when I read that paragraph land that produces thorns and thistles. Uh, <clears throat> so, we can come to class, we can debate theological points. All we want, we can know a lot of arguments, both sides of the question, and all of that. But what are we doing with that information to help others? So, even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are confident of better things in your case, things that accompany salvation. 
again, that sounds a lot like Paul writing to a specific church, you know, the, you, but again, we don't know. Uh, we talked about who is this address, is addressed to he, Hebrews, Jewish, the diaspora, those who've been dispersed throughout the Roman world, or the Jews in Palestine. But this, this sounds like he's got some particular people in mind. Uh, sounds like the concern, but it doesn't come from just him, but you know, this is the first time he, he seems to be used we, you know, pertain to somebody other than himself. Okay. I'm not talking about the community, <clears throat> you know, where he, he, he brings himself into their community. Yeah, we here, but we who are sending this message to you, you know, this is the first time he sort of like used, you know, this message is not coming just from him, but yeah. this message is coming from, you know, yeah. beyond, you know, more than just him. Yeah, um, and, uh, you know, we, well, uh, we're confident of better things in your case, things that accompany salvation. That's interesting. It accompanies salvation that you, grow in Christ, uh, that you, God will provide opportunities. Somebody may ask you to do something uh, in connection with the church. And you say, well, I, I don't like that person, or I can't do that. But do we view that as the invitation of God? That God is speaking to me. We need to look for that. Anyway, that's a lot. Of God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help him. Here's another answer to the question. What is the meat of the word? And right here, uh, help his people and continue to help them. Help his people. Anyway, I'll never, well, I'll never forget an elder here, I won't mention, it goes back a long, long way. A fellow came to his door one time and uh, said he needed some help and that he was a member of the church. And this fellow, his wife said, we can't help him. We don't really know who he is or, you know, where he and the, the, the fellow said, we've got to help him. He's a, a member of the church, regardless of, you know, sometimes you get defrauded. Maybe somebody said that they need help and they didn't. But it's better to err on the side of generosity. And I'll never forget when I learned about that, that uh, it was a lesson. And we've tried to follow that lesson in this church. Dan has sat in with us when we talk to people in need, and uh, I think we've never turned anybody away. We have put limits on it at times. time. Well, because somebody the, seems people to come to church and said, they're going to, I'll repay it. We, we never, you know, know, but, uh, we've been taken advantage of many times. Yeah, but uh, that's between that person and God. On uh, their conscience, not ours. That's right. We've responded. Yeah, for their conscience. It's a That's a very serious thing uh, because if you are not, you don't need the help and you run to the Lord's house just to, I mean, do them, you are in serious trouble. Spiritually, you don't even know what you are leading to. Yeah. I have refused help. I mean, not personally, but, you know, during my eviction, you know, you know, that should, you know, first man, you know, well, why don't you see so-and-so for, you know, any help, monetary help, okay? And I'm like, you know what? Just pray for me, okay? Instead of going through my attention, uh -huh. just pray for me. I, I, I'm not worried about the money because if I start taking money out of your poor, uh, out of your benevolence fund, then that might prevent somebody who really needs the money I mean, I can take advantage of that. What I'm trying to say is that, that, but you know, that might prevent somebody, i.e., from taking. You know, that might really. Yeah, it. Uh, and I appreciate that. 
that sentiment. But, you know, sometimes we, we've, we said that the being a Christian entails helping others. Sometimes being a Christian entails accepting help. And that, you know, some of us say, well, I, I don't feel comfortable doing that. I don't feel comfortable accepting help. But you know what we're saying? That we're, we're saying, well, I, I believe I can do it all myself. And we can't. And so sometimes we need to graciously and thankfully accept gifts and accept help from others because maybe that helps others be more giving. So there's both sides of it and it expresses recognition that we can't do it all ourselves. And uh, if someone sees something I need, <laughs> you know, uh, receive gifts with thankfulness and learn from that experience. That takes all humility. Yeah. Humility, okay. Well, humility, <laughs> That's a good uh, a one word uh, summary of that. Uh, I kind of bristle at people that say they pull themselves up by their own bootstraps, you know. That's yeah. why I hear somebody like that. Yeah. They're very successful, a movie yeah. actor or a businessman, but they didn't really. Yeah. They were honest with themselves. They got help. Right. Starting right. when they right. came out of their, you know, uh, their mother's birth canal, well, they wouldn't have made it without a lot of help along the way. But they're too arrogant to admit it. That's right. You know, and that's kind of the way it applies here, I think. And none of us pull ourselves all the way up in Christ by ourselves. It's just not, it's not, um, the church is, you know, is here to help us, you know, basically. Yeah. yeah. So we, because the God knew we couldn't do it by ourselves. So, helping God's people is very important. Uh, he will not forget your work, the love you've shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show this same diligence to the very end in order to make your hope sure. Make your hope sure. <laughs> we do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. There's a, a word, imitate, imitate. Uh, are there people that we try to imitate? Elvis. Elvis, yeah. <laughs> He's got a lot of imitators in the world. That's a singer, you know. Yeah, too many. Yeah. But uh, over the place. I, I'm sure that if we're honest with ourselves, we can look at our lives and find people that we're trying to imitate. Maybe it's mother or father. Maybe it's others in the church, teachers, preachers, uh, those who <coughs> done some what we'd call menial things uh, that we're trying to imitate. But that's an interesting word. We need to have some people that we're trying to imitate. I Like I sometimes remember incidents like that one that I just recorded in the life of an elder. There's some I can try to imitate. Uh, and uh, in the same way, we need to live lives so that people can say, I want to imitate her. I want to imitate him. Uh, it takes people. It, yes, we can learn and imitate Christ, but it helps if we see people putting Christ into practice in their lives from day to day and we imitate them. So anyway, and then he says it. Imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Take some time to imitate. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> now, th this is a different paragraph. I don't know if there's any connection here. See if you see a connection between this next thought, which will continue. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. Uh, so God swore by himself 
as part of the oath. It uh, used to be when you took an oath in court that you swore on the Bible. I don't think most judges use that. Uh, I've seen one who did, but most of them don't use it anymore. In the old days, if you watch so, uh, or learn about the old practice, you kissed the book or kissed the Testament as a sign of your oath. But anyway, God's he's transitioning. He's transitioning. We see promise and oath to the next section. Okay. Okay. He's transitioning. Yeah, promise. What has been promised? Right. So is the word promise is stuck in his mind or her mind. <laughs> uh, so the promise of God, the promise of Abraham. And that's why, you know, we could say, well, that would happen, you know, uh, 3,500 years ago or something. Uh, it, that's why it's important, even for us we may not be Jewish, to study and learn about the history of God's promises and their fulfillment. It helps us to have a stronger faith in the promises made specifically to us, that God kept his promise when it looked impossible to Abraham, uh, that he will have a, a son. And it happened. 25 years after the first promise was made when Abraham was 75 and he was 100 when his son Isaac was born. And that's why they laughed. Uh, Sarah laughed. <laughs> Abraham is uh... anyway uh, so the promise so he's going to go on and talk about the promise. Men swear by someone greater than themselves. And the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. And you see that I, in the movies and there, I don't know if you've ever run into it. You said, somebody, I swear on my mother's grave. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what people swear by an idol, I guess, in some places, swear by some other thing that's sought to be sacred to make their words be, ring more true. Jesus says we shouldn't uh, try to embellish what we say. We should always tell the truth. It doesn't mean that we can't affirm or even swear that we're telling the truth in, in the court of law. It's just that like God took an oath. Uh, Jesus took an oath when he was on trial. Not in the same words that we use in today's courtroom, Paul, in a sense that, anyway, uh, men swear by someone greater than themselves because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear to the heirs of what was promised. He said, it's all of us, we're the heirs. Uh, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us may be greatly encouraged. Uh, so what are the two things that, he's, that uh, we have? Two unchangeable things. It's very subtle here. <laughs> Very subtle. Uh, well, maybe you've watched one of those courtroom shows on television or heard, and, and somebody will say to uh, the uh, defendant, you don't have any evidence that uh, you did this or that you were there or that you didn't do this. Well, he does. His testimony is strong evidence <laughs> And the legal world recognizes that the testimony is evidence. But the other thing here in the case of God, not only does he say it, he takes an oath. Those are the two things, just the test, the bare testimony and the oath are the two things that he's talking about here. And testimony is a powerful uh, uh, evidence in the court. 
even if, even if you're a suspect because you're the defendant or somebody else's suspect, the testimony is powerful evidence. We've got a trial going on down in that federal court here in Chicago right now where somebody's given evidence and uh, we'll see if it's believed. This is the alternate Eddie Burke. Anyway, uh, we'll go into that. But uh, so the two unchangeable things, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. Uh, oh boy, we're out of time. Where Jesus who went before us has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So there's where we'll start next time. What is the inner sanctuary? And who is this guy named Melchizedek? We've heard, heard uh, references to him two or three times. Now we're going to get, he has his, old, oh, his own chapter, chapter seven. <laughs> so thank you. <clears throat> I don't ever met anybody with the name Melchizedek. <laughs> Did you? I, as I said, I, I had never heard of Mehershal Hashbaz until this singer named Mehershal Hashbaz.